Hi everyone, today I want to talk about a language extension that many people use but uh, has some subtlety and, and I sorry, what I want to go through it. The language extension is scoped type variables and we're going to go through a motivation of why we might want scoped type variables and how it works and then some of its interesting dark corners. So, um, yeah, so my motivating example is to write the filter function. So the filter function, right, takes um, uh, some predicate that, that uh, tells us whether some type A or uh, an element of some type A is in a set, and then a list, and then we were, we're going to keep every element that, um, that meets the predicate. So it, it might look something like this. So, so if we're filtering an empty list, we get an empty list back. Otherwise, if we have x cons x's, then if the predicate holds of x, then we keep it and we filter the remaining part of the list. Otherwise... We don't keep x, and we just filter the remaining part of the list. Okay, so let's compile this. Oh, oh, and then now we're confused because we're recurring, and we don't know which filter to use, and I don't want to use a prelude one, so I will do that. Oh, define but not use prelude. Yes, that's true. We'll come back to that. Um, so if I write filter odd one two three four five, then sure enough, we get the odd numbers in the list. Everything is good. Uh, the problem is, is that this is this feels a little bit silly because every time I recur with filter, I pass the same pred. So this pred is not sort of interesting in the recursion, and and I want to make that a little bit more apparent to a reader of this function that I'm never going to substitute a different pred in. Um, so what I really want to do is I want to bind that once and then use it um, uh, many times. So I might rewrite my function like this. It's going to have the same type. Let's let Emacs catch up. There we go. So it's going to have the same type. And here I'm going to bind pred once, and then I'm going to refer to this function go. Um, and this is a very common idiom to just have some helper function that does the real work of, 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 your, of your sort of non-helper function, your main function. So here I'm going to say go on an empty list. Well, that's just the empty list. Otherwise, it's x cons x's. And then if the predicate holds of x, then I return it. Otherwise, I just recur. Right. And and this is a slightly nicer implementation because I'm only binding pred once. I don't have to keep passing it around. Um, and so if I compile this and then run the same test case, then I get the same result. All is well. But now, now, what if I want to give a type signature to this? I want to be able to comment a little bit, let's say. And, and type signatures are, are helpful for understanding the code better. So this is going to be a function from a list of A to a list of A. OK. And this makes sense, right, because here, filter pred, well, pred is the first argument, so that means that the right-hand side has to be something list of A to list of A, and I've said, oh, go is list of A to list of A, all is well. But when I try to compile this, I get this very large, very annoying error. This is not a large program. There's nothing else going on behind the hood, uh, behind the hood, under the hood. Um, but, but here we get this big error, could not expected type, could not match expected type A with actual type A1. Well, that's very annoying. I haven't written A1 anywhere. A1 is a rigid type variable. Oh, what's that? Um, in the type signature for go, for all A1, I didn't write this for all business. What's going on here? Um, so I could continue to, to, to take apart this error message. It's not a very good error message at all. But what's really going on here is that GHC makes no relationship at all between this A and this A. Instead, what it does is every time GHC sees a type variable in a type signature, it universally quantifies it. And so this A is not in scope. We don't know what this A refers to. So that must mean it's some fresh A. So really, GHC's interpretation for this type signature is to put this for all in front. Um, and that's normally a good thing. It, it allows us to write things like id colon colon A arrow A, and everything just works. The problem is, is that in this type signature, GHC does the same thing. So it says that this is also true for all A. The problem is, is that now this pred, well, what's the type of pred here? Well, the type of pred is going to be A arrow bool, but it's going to be this outer A. And yet I call it on X, but what's the type of X? Well, the type of X is this inner A. And these are two separate A's. And so that's where A1 comes from, is that when GHC is producing the error message, it does something called tidying. And tidying involves going through all the type variables and making sure that none of them have the same name. Because two different things with the same name is awfully confusing. So I'm actually going to make the change in my code here, because this is how GHC interprets my, my definition.
right? That old definition that I wrote, without the for alls and without the, the a1, it really interprets it this way, because this is a different a variable than this. And now the error starts to make a little bit more sense. Um, uh, it still says this stuff about rigid, and that just means that we're not solving for a1. a1 is some type that's universally quantified. So, th so the question then becomes, how do I write a type signature on Go? Um, well, I somehow have to relate this. In other words, I have to bring this A into scope in such a way that I can access it down here. That, whoops, that is what scope type variables does. So let's turn on scope type variables. And of course, that by itself doesn't do anything. So one might say, oh, well, I don't want this to be a for all anymore, and I don't want this to be A1. I really want this to be A. And now everything is well, because what's happening here is that this A is in scope, and now I can access this A down here. So here, when I call pred x, it's the same A in both places, and all is well. But there are subtleties, because scope type variables is a bit confusing. So one subtlety is, is I wrote these for alls in, um, but but actually, uh, I don't, uh, maybe I didn't, you know, need to have. I wrote them in to sort of explain in this video, but maybe I, I, I didn't mean to, or maybe I didn't actually do this. Now when I compile, I still get the same errors. So what's weird, what I find weird about scoped type variables, is it doesn't actually bring type variables into scope by default. Instead, you have to, you have to politely ask GHC, oh, please, would you bring this one into scope? And we do that by writing for all A which is weird because normally the for all a is redundant, as we saw. It's just sort of something that's automatically added. But when scope type variables is on, it's no longer redundant. It actually does the scoping. And now things work. We have to be careful, though. We don't want to put a for all a here because now my for all a is actually making a new a. We're back to the same problem we had before, and we're going to get this big, ugly error. So we have to be quite careful with where we write our for alls. So that's your sort of basic understanding of scope type variables, is that we can bring a type variable into scope with a for all a on this outer signature, and then it's going to be in scope for the inner signature. But of course, nothing in GHC is simple. So let's say, for reasons inscrutable, um, I put parentheses around my type. Normally, paren redundant parentheses shouldn't matter. But now when I recompile, I'm back into the same old ugly problem here. And that's because GHC has a very special syntactic rule for finding scoped type variables. It must be a for all that appears right after the colon colon. Here, my for all does not appear right after the colon colon. It's hidden underneath a parenthesis. So I suppose we could look through these parentheses, but, but actually there's a few other strange things that we're going to observe um, that, that matter sort of whether it's the very first thing or not. And so this is, is, is sort of consistent with other things that GHC does that, that we'll explore in just a moment. But this is very strange, I think, uh, at first at least. Um, okay, so we see that parentheses will, will kill it off. Um, let's say we, we modify our function to um, also take an extra parameter, b, that's just ignored. Um, actually, it's going to be cleaner if I do it here. And then I could just say that, and, and, it, and it's ignored. So now, if I try to compile, I get not in scope, type variable b. Well, that's quite strange, because if I get rid of the for all a, and let me comment out this type signature, which is going to cause trouble. Now everything is OK again, right? So, so here, what GHC does is it implicitly brings both A and B into scope. But once I have the for all A, now suddenly it needs B to be explicitly brought into scope. So this is the, called the for all or nothing rule, um, which sounds good, but don't try to tease that apart because it doesn't really make any sense. But it's, for, it's the for all or nothing rule. And it says that once you have a for all, then you must do, the for all must cover all of the variables um, uh, that, that are brought into scope. Or we cannot have a for all, that's the nothing case, and then everything works. So you either have to have all or nothing. So here I could say for all a, b. But once again, things are slightly strange. So this, by the way, will work with my, my inner type signature. But let's get rid of that again. Um, this is still slightly strange because the for all or nothing rule also only applies for top level, um, uh, top level quantification. So here we have an error. But if I put my parentheses around my type, now everything is OK again because it's only the top level for all that triggers the for all or nothing rule. So in this way, it, 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 it is somewhat consistent. Um, 
Now, what if I want to be really explicit about everything? I'm, I'm the person who really likes to be explicit. And here, maybe I'm not sure exactly what's the right thing to type. So I actually type in CROC, and I'm going to get errors here. Um, but I want to be able to tell the difference for when GHC is going to bring something into scope versus not. And I want to specifically say here that I don't want GHC to bring anything into scope. Maybe I have 10 type variables in scope, and I've mistyped the name of one of them. Um, so here I can say don't bring anything into scope by saying for all dot, right? This connects with the for all or nothing rule because now I'm triggering the for all or nothing rule and it won't try to bring C into scope. So here I get a much more innocent error, not in scope, type variable C, because I've said that every variable in this type signature should already be in scope. So if I go back to A, this actually works. Right? Because here I'm not bringing any variable into scope in, in this local type signature. Instead, this A is referring to this outer one. So if I want to be super explicit, I can imagine beginning every type signature with for all and then the list of variables, or for all and then dot, saying I don't want to bring any new type variables into scope here. Um, this for all dot, um, uh, maybe I'm dating myself a little bit, but it reminds me a little bit of use strict from my Perl days. I actually had Perl days. I'm sorry about that. Um, so... Um, Let's see, I think that's probably enough on scope type variables in, in, in this example. Um, scope type variables does affect other constructs too, notably instance declarations, where it brings the variables from the instance head in scope in any, in any bodies there. But I don't think it's quite worth put, putting up a whole new example for that. I hope this has been interesting. Thanks very much for watching. Bye.